So that brings us to question seven. How did the Earth get so much oxygen? I mean, it's a very good thing. We definitely depend on it. And the, the key that unlocked the oxygen that was locked away in the rocks was sunlight and color. Life that captures sunlight with color also releases oxygen. And so life catches sunlight with color by making a pigment. And why would life make a pigment? You know, it's not like, like it's trying to impress the other life forms, you know, or things like that. Not at these levels, okay? Uh, we have microbial levels and we have microbes making pigments and turning colors. Why do those Winogradsky columns have those different colors? Well, it's because pigments are very, very useful molecules. You can make a pigment if you need an umbrella to shield yourself against high energy light, or if you need a net to catch visible light and then use it, or if you need a sponge to absorb stray electrons, it will stick to like reactive oxygen species that might be floating around the cell. Oxygen radicals that can cause damage to the cell, it can actually protect you. Uh, and it can even stick to sticky metals. They can stick to iron. And remember that barium that we saw that was stuck to the dye, the red dye? Well, that red dye was made by a form of life. Or at least it's very close. I'm not sure about that exact one. And so the pigments, these can all act as colors for art. And it's where we get a lot of our natural, uh, our natural pigments and natural colors from. The thing about this is, again, you don't have to go deep in the periodic table to get these. To get all the colors, you can make pretty much a full spectrum from just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with a few little accessory atoms around there. So when you look at the sunlight reaching the Earth, it's being caught by plants and turned into energy. It's being turned into life, really. And the sunlight reaching the Earth has this shape right there. And you see how the, here's different pigments, and this shows what light they catch. If you look at just one pigment, it only catches a little bit of the sunlight reaching the Earth. But when you take all the pigments and you add up all of what they catch together, then you see that working together, they are working together to capture the whole spectrum of light reaching the Earth. And so each of these individual pigments is nice in itself, but you really need the full spectrum to be able to really capture sunlight and turn it into life. So for instance, uh, these are chlorophylls found in leaves, and these are mostly carbon and oxygen. They have a couple of nitrogens and magnesium in the middle, and magnesium is important to how they work. These are so complex, they're only worth making when it's summer. So when it turns autumn, and the leaves start to change color because they aren't making these complex pigments anymore. You see the simpler ones, which are red. Carrots are orange, not to capture sunlight, but um, for one of the other purposes. But they have beta carotene, which you end up chopping up and turning into, um, into vitamin A or the result of vitamin A. And that's just a carbon chain. It's just a carbon chain with carbons, hydrogens, a couple oxygens maybe. So that makes orange, the other one makes green. Different red plants have all sorts of different red pigments. And you can actually do an experiment where you take different red plants here, and you, take, uh, you grind them up, you dissolve them in different solutions, and they turn different colors. And so that right there is kind of neat. It shows you that the different pigments in the plants are different. Like a rose pigment is different from a radish, and different from red cabbage. But you can even compare these to pure solutions of pigments in, certain, in the same conditions. And then you can compare them and say, okay, which one of the, well, let me ask you, which one of these colors most closely matches cyanin? Which one of these plants uses cyanin the most? So you kind of hold them up and you, you compare it. Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, red cabbage has cyanin in it. And so you can draw conclusions based on that by separating out the different molecules. Now, the thing I want to show you, all these molecules are red, they have different properties, and they're different arrangements of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. You don't have to go deep into the periodic table to make those. Here's the actual recipe for recreating this. This is what I, how I believe you could recreate that experiment in your own kitchen. Um, the thing that you would have to do, you have to have an acid tube with drops of lemon juice is what I suggest to try, just plain water. Then have a neutral buffered solution. I think aquarium buffers can get you here. And then finally, a little bit of base, like uh, most cleaners are bases, so a little bit of ammonia would be the fourth tube. If you do that, you can do this exact experiment from those, uh, those things. And you can investigate other colors, uh, like other, um, although this probably works best with those red ones. But it would work with other ones as well. 
In fact, you can even make bacteria that will make lots of different colors, these five different colors. You can grow bacteria by giving them particular food. They will produce these different molecules. Notice that these molecules, again, are mostly carbon, and each one of them is colored the color that it is. And so if you take these pig pigments and then you grow them up, you can make extracts from them, give them to your students, and your students can paint a flask of bacteria from them, which seems kind of like artistic and looping around on itself, kind of Escher-like, I don't know. But you can make paints from bacteria this way because the bacteria can make these carbon bonds. Okay, so microbes are colorful. You might have seen things like this, and you might know that insects can be colorful too. If you see all these beetles, now all these beetles actually have a different kind of color. Notice how it's iridescent, how it has lots of colors together. It looks different from the regular pigments that you might see in many other um, cases. That's because it's a different kind of color. It's called structural color, and it comes from the beetle making an ordered array of molecules and it interacts with light in a weird way, okay? And that results in the opalescent sheen of these things. We're going to return to structural colors a little bit later. But uh, other times, so the color in a, in a bug might come from the same kind of thing that we were talking about a couple slides ago, where you have carbon-oxygen pigments. In fact, there is one bug called cochineal that contains high amounts of a pigment called carmine. And so what they would do, when it, was, it, was a re, it contains really high amounts, and the pigment's really nice and red, and it works really well. So what you do is you go to the Mexican cactus, you scrape off the beetles, you grind up the beetles, and you get a red pigment out of it, because they're making it for you. This is what they're making. And again, it looks like just carbons and oxygens. It just happens to be that it absorbs light to look red to us. So these are... Some old pigments are made this way by uh, processing beetles and things like that. And in fact, around the 1500s, they play a role in the economy as well. Venice made a lot of red lake pigments like this because it had a big textile economy, and it's one of the byproducts of it was uh, a lot of red lake pigments that came out of life. So that means that you can take an insect and you can have an art installation like this one right here. This is called In the Midnight Garden. And what it is is... Uh, it's they, they took carmine, the red pigment, and they painted it on the walls, and then they mounted the bugs that it comes from and other similar bugs on the walls. So you can look at that, and you can see that there's carmine on the wall, and there's carmine on the wall in another sense, on, in the bug on the wall. Play with prepositions. And so there's a whole room of this, so you can look around. They posted this on their Flickr account. So I'm thinking field trip. Um, but the thing about this is that the bugs were making that pigment for their own purposes, not necessarily for the color, but we can use the color as a nice little byproduct and we can turn it into a room that is red. So as the pigments capture energy for life, life goes on. And one of the things about life that you should know is that life needs electrons. Remember we had the serpentinite that made electrons and that stuck carbons together? Light needs electrons for those same reasons. The serpentinite made hydrogen which, you see it's right here, hydrogen contains the electrons that stick life together. So all life needs to hoard electrons because life needs to build stuff. It needs to stick stuff together. But the chemical opposite of hydrogen is oxygen. And so if life is hoarding all of this stuff, it must reject oxygen to keep things in balance. That means as life goes on, it's going to eject oxygen or oxidize things into the environment and life will unlock the oxygen from the rocks using photosynthesis, using the light it captured from the sun with the pigments. And so that is how color results in oxygen. Now remember that which particular plant, which insect gets which color might not be predictable. But overall, the ecosystem will catch more light by filling with color, and this will happen predictably. This results in an overall trend Overall, oxygen goes up over time, a predictable upward trend. 